All right, hello students. It's Ms. McKenzie, your K-12 district teacher librarian. And I have the pleasure of introducing Elisa Patterson, who is one of our Sayusa School District um, employees. And what we're talking about today is um, we've started doing micro virtual field trips. So every single month, um, one of our virtual field trips is a micro trip. And I'm gonna just share my screen real quick before I hand it over to Alisa and just kind of share uh, where we've been. And I wanted to bring up the very first micro trip we did last year was looking at grains of sand. So every single month, we usually have about four virtual field trips. With my Fulbright, we're trying to take one trip and make sure it's outside of our community so we can explore the world. And um, we're kind of focusing those around the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So this month was water. Um, one of our trips is trying to highlight the work inside of the school district. Um, one trip is trying to highlight our community. And then one trip is a micro trip. So ideally, we collect samples from places that we've been uh, for the month, and then we look at them underneath the microscope. So this was last year's first trip. Um, I think we were at one of our beaches in town. And so we collected grains of sand and a bunch of other samples and then looked at them under the microscope. Um, and we're kind of taking that even a step further in um, kind of doing some, we're, we're gonna start doing some art challenges too with our micro virtual field trips. And on that note, I will just share um, because Elisa and I have a lot in common in that we're both kind of naturalists and we both produce a lot of artwork that's based on nature. And so when I'm not being a librarian, um, I'm usually producing mixed media artwork and a lot of it, I do a lot of my painting at home, but then I take my artwork to the beach to do a lot of the stitching. And a lot of my little stitched designs are actually inspired by tide pooling. Like maybe some of you can see how these might look like sea anemones or um, urchins and that, anyway, I'm, I love tide pooling. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And Elisa, will you please introduce yourself and tell us about what you're doing here in the school district and then about yourself as an artist? Sure, um, I'm Elisa Patterson. I'm the resource teacher at the elementary school. And right now I'm working mostly with third, fourth and fifth graders with resource math and reading. And that's what I've been, and I'm new here this year. I've been a teacher for over 20 years, and I have um, two children, two daughters who are also teachers in other states. And a child who is one of our library assistants at the middle school as well, which is awesome. Yes, he loves um, that. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your art career? Sure. I have actually been an art teacher. I've taught arts um, K through 12 at different times. Um, I would teach on a schedule, so I was the art teacher, and kids would come to me every every week for an hour or an hour and a half block. And so I have experience teaching art as well. Um, I've always just been an artist. My mother was an artist and an and an incredible quilter. She was an award winning quilter. They travel her work traveled the world. Um, so yeah, I've worked with lots of comments. I think we talked about it because my mother yeah. has a sewing business. So that uh -huh. sewing and um, what do you call it? Fiber art has worked its way into my artwork because of my mother's influence. In my yes. Life. And my daughter did a big um, project in college where she was using stitching and painting together. So it reminded me a lot of yours. There's always have done art. I've entered art contests in elementary school um, all along the way. So I grew up in a, in a very creative place and where I was able to express myself that way and outside a lot too, <laughs> which plays into that. Um, so always, always consider myself an artist to, from a very young age. Do you, do you wanna share a little bit about your GPS artwork? And I'll preface this by saying our last virtual field trip was with Caitlin Wells, who's another new uh, member to the Sayusa School District. Her mother also teaches science at the high school, and Caitlin has a degree and a background in, in working in art, art in the field of art mm -hmm. and museums. And she, last week, she shared 
she had created, um, oh, I forget the technical term now, but it's etching into copper and then creating prints off of your copper plates. Bien Taglio. Yes, and yeah. she did a mm -hmm. whole series inspired by um, my, the microscopic viewing of tears. Like when yes. you cry from an onion, those tears look different than like tears of sorrow or tears of joy. And so she did micro, microscopic inspired artwork as well. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, tell us about your GPS inspired. Okay. So the GPS really just comes from traveling and, and coming, you know, marking your coordinates. And that would be the GPS series of where I was. So I have an example of one of my paintings, if you want me to grab it. Yes, so this, show this, and tell. Ooh. This would have had the GPS coordinates for Yellowstone. And these were the bacterial mats. And so this is my interpretation of the mats. Is that done with alcohol inks? It is. That's so beautiful. Yeah, these are alcohol inks, and this is a, a UPO, which is a synthetic paper. Um, mineral paper is also our stone paper I work on a lot too. So that's. Hey, do that's you want to say a little bit more about the paper? Because UPO, sure. mineral, and stone, I'm familiar with UPO, and it's such an interesting creature. And I don't think a lot mm -hmm. of uh, people who aren't immersed in art know about those different types of paper. Right, so UPO paper is, it's uh, synthetic, it's, it's more of a plastic base, but it still holds, it doesn't, it's not so plasticky that your paint and materials are going to run off of it, so it has some absorbent qualities as well. And then when you get into mineral papers, it also has a synthetic backing. Um, Ogami is a brand name, sometimes um, they're more known for their notebooks that a geologist might take out in the field because you're going to be able to write on it and it's not going to tear and it can get rained on and your work's not going to disappear. So that's one of those. And stone paper is just a heavier version of mineral paper. And if you just kind of think about it, clay board um, is, a, is a nice layer of clay on, on a board and it's absorbent, but, but it repels as well. So it just has unique properties and you know, moving away from tree-based papers or looking for different materials that behave in different ways is that's part of it. It's, it's interesting material for sure. Do you have more of the your GPS samples? I, to show? I do. Let's see. And while you're grabbing those, I have I have started following quite a few artists. Um, I think it's a whole genre or a vein of artistry is like micro art there. If you're on Instagram, you can find tons of artists who are doing microscopic inspired artwork. That is gorgeous. So this was my last piece that I finished in um, the GPS coordinates were this were happy camp where I used to live on the Klamath River. So my backyard, <laughs> but it's, it's a river. Um, an interpretation could be tree river but also just going into those microcosms of beating heart in your veins and, and the way that trees pulse nutrients through a tree like we, we do. Hey, do and you want to say gonna... more about trees and water <laughs> and the pulsing? Because I know we yes. had like a brief conversation oh, yeah. about that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, here's, this one is another, that's a, a GPS from, this one is from um, Utah. So the dry trees. And it's just, a, this one is very simplified. I so I have some that. that are complex and some that are more simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, these are the stone arches. So this would be more of a macro. And the stone. Beautiful. Thanks. Do you prefer, yeah, yeah. is your favorite um, art supply inks like alcohol ink or water, watercolor or um, dye-based inks? Right, currently I've mostly been working with the alcohol ink and I like to experiment with the science part of it. Uh, the different percentages of the isopropyl alcohol actually vary in viscosity. So it can depend on how long it takes to evaporate the ink or push out into those forms. And when you see the work close up, you can see that they create their own edges and, and their flow. And then if you put an ink next to it, it's gonna to need to flow around that just like a, a rock in a river and it has to go around. So 
it's fun to play with like that. Yeah. Oops, I love that. And I was a, a clinical lab science major before I was an English major, before yeah. I was a teacher <laughs> librarian. And um, had I been born maybe 10 years later, I think I would honestly be working in some kind of art supply field or graphic design. Mm -hmm. um, and I love the chemistry. I, I'm fascinated with the chemistry of art supplies. And I would love to be a paint technologist for like yes. or Liquitex. Yeah. And that's part of my joy in doing artwork too is most often it's not even about the final product. It's about the process and the joy of working with different mm -hmm. products. And like you said, like experimenting with how different products interact and, and how they work on different surfaces. Um, anyway. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was working on clay board, which is a heavier duty surface of clay on a board, um, using the inks, but then removing the inks with the scratching tool but then also adding metallic powders and heating those. So I would really experiment and play around with a new, a new material in a way it wasn't meant to be used. So embossing powder, people are sometimes familiar with, with making stationery or cards, but I was using it on clay board and adhering it with heat to the clay on top of my, my carved design. And so that was an, another science art project. <laughs> and we were talking about, um, you know, how micro art and nature art fits into school. Um, if you're thinking about mathematics in particular and science, those two really, I love to combine those with art. And it makes a lot of sense to kids, especially fractals. It can be, it can be a concept that's hard to get a hold of, but when you're thinking about a grain of sand and how the rock cycle works and a grain of sand being a fractal of a pebble and a pebble being a fractal of a, a boulder, or the branching of a tree. So you can talk about pi and the mathematics that go into nature because nature is very mathematical and very musical in that way. So you can, you can tie those things in together too. And of course, science, um, you know, nature and science and biology and, and chemistry with their art. So, so you many know, fun things. A, there's a place for, there is so, I just wish we would immerse and embed more art into our school system. Mm -hmm. um, I love, you know, libraries celebrate and champion STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Yep. And oftentimes people will say the, the basis of a STEAM lesson is you just got to take two of the five and, and join them together and, and design the learning activities around at least two of those five. And so we have so many opportunities to add and layer in art. Mm -hmm. Um, into all the other things that we're doing. And I just think of student engagement mm -hmm. and active learning. I mean, all the things that we're always striving to do as educators and, and just how art, um, even for students and people who don't think they're artists, just the virtue of exploring creates a more engaging learning environment, no matter what subject area you're working in. It's true, and it also can teach you to take risks and that nothing has to be permanent. So it's, it, it also gives you that feeling like, hey, it's okay to make uh, what you might consider a mistake, you know, and, and learning from those happy accidents. And <laughs> Yes, happy yeah. accidents. Yeah. Whenever I do makerspace pro uh, projects with classes, I'm like, this is all about the process. Like, yeah, you hope okay. you end up with a fun and product, but it's really about the process and the making of the mistakes. And it learning. really is. And yeah. when I'm doing my art at home, it's very relaxing. It's very meditative. Watching the ink flow. Those are things that put me in a better space and a better place and relaxed and ready to come back and do my work. Um, and it really is a process. I was talking to my teacher's aide about that when I brought my artwork in, you know, we were talking about that process being so important. Yeah. Um, and then the end product being something that you can be happy with or that you're okay with tossing and, and trying again. Yeah, yeah, I love recycling. I have a lot of, I don't technically toss them, but I certainly recycle <laughs> a lot of old art pieces. And yeah, yeah the, the meditative process, the flow, right? Artists always talk mm -hmm. about finding your flow. And um, Every year, well, I'll show you. I don't think I have my updated one in here, but every year I have a word of the year. Were we having this conversation too? I think Black. we did talk about that. 
Yeah. Last year it was create and I literally carry it around in my pocket or next to my heart. Okay. And it's like, you know, I want to be creative this year. Um, um, this year, my word was flow and just taking the time to find moments of flow every single day, because like mm -hmm. you said, it's so important uh, physiologically, I think for human beings yep. and my flow, I find the most flow in the evenings when I'm stitching. I mean, I do all sorts of other artistic, you know, all these other avenues, but when I'm still and stitching, mm -hmm. that's when I um, achieve my best flow. And so I try to make, yeah. I try to find flow every day. And it sounds like you do too. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you have to make time for it though. You have to prioritize <laughs> joy and flow. That's right. Yeah. Um, let's see. So is there anything else we can wrap up our conversation? Is there anything else you want to show us or what are you currently working on? I wanted to ask you, do you carry I travel have a, journals? Do you do I, travel journals when you? I do have a few of those. I take a sketchbook with me pretty much everywhere I go. Um, sometimes I'll paint on it with watercolor and I'll leave it out in the rain <laughs> and see what happens. Love I'll do things like that. Um, I have a piece that's in progress right now. I can show you. It's it's from this area. So, let's see. So this I was more you know living back on the coast. Oh, that's and beautiful. The beach and ocean. Um, some of the sand sculptures that I've seen lately are kind of in this one. <laughs> what size is that? That looks like a pretty good this size. Piece. Pretty good. About that. Is that Yupo? This is Yupo. Is that yeah. you purchased that on a roll? On a big roll. Okay. Yes. Yupo yeah. paper is expensive and it's more mm -hmm. affordable when you do buy bigger in bulk, right? That's right. Yeah, our big stack of stone paper. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me to do this. It was fun. Yeah, we'll come. I think I'm going to come up with some art challenges and I, I'm, I, I will keep you in the loop. And thank you so much for sharing your, your awesomeness and your joy with Sayusa School District. And students, stay tuned for more super rad micro virtual field trips in the future. We'll see you next week, everyone. That sounds Bye. good. Thank you. Bye.